Okay, hi everyone and welcome. Um, Aloha Kako. My name is Miley Arvin and I am co-director of Pacific Island Studies uh, here at the University of Utah. It's my great pleasure to welcome you to the first event in our spring symposium series. I'm speaking to you from my home in Salt Lake City. Um, and for those who may only be listening instead of viewing the screen, uh, I am a light-skinned Native Hawaiian woman with dark hair in my 30s. And uh, my Zoom background image shows an aerial photo of the Salt Lake Valley with some uh, buildings of the University of Utah campus visible in the foreground. Oh, let me stop my screen share so you can see. Um, yeah, and um, in the background are the Wasatch Mountains. And there's also a border of a red Pacifica pattern block U logo that represents our Pacific Island Studies program around, around the background. So this image of the beautiful land here reminds me to begin by sharing the indigenous land acknowledgement written for the University of Utah. We acknowledge that this land, which is named for the Ute tribe, is the traditional and ancestral homeland of the Shoshone, Paiute, Goshute, and Ute tribes. The University of Utah recognizes and respects the enduring relationship that exists between many indigenous peoples and their traditional homelands. We respect the sovereign relationship between tribes, states, and the federal government, and we affirm the University of Utah's commitment to a partnership with Native nations and urban Indian communities through research, education, and community outreach activities. So I really hope our words here today, though focused on Pacific Islanders, remain in good relation with the Ute, Shoshone, Paiute, and Goshu peoples. Thank you to Dean Catherine Stockton for her support of this event and Pacific Island Studies overall, as well as our funders, the Mellon Foundation and the University of Utah's Global Learning Across the Disciplines grant from the Office of Global Engagement. This series, Pedagogies for Indigeneity and Diaspora, Pacific Studies at Home and Abroad, brings together a number of teachers, activists, and community leaders to talk about what it means to teach Pacific Studies in the current moment. In the pandemic fueled shift to online teaching and conferencing, what are the pedagogies, both old and new, that Pacific Islander scholars, activists, teachers, and performers are drawing on to educate and foster knowledge relevant to Pacific Islander people? So this panel is the first of four panels happening uh, today and tomorrow and follows um, from a launch panel that happened on March 18th. Throughout the symposium, we take special inspiration from the work of the late scholar and poet Teresia Tewa. Her work, which so creatively trans transgressed disciplinary boundaries, continues to offer a vibrant model of teaching Pacific studies at home and abroad. The title of the panel today, Oceanic Fluidarities, like the titles of all the panels in the symposium are quotes from her work. Within the broad topic of Pacific Island Studies Pedagogies for Indigeneity and Diaspora, this panel focuses specifically on issues of gender and sexuality. So the structure for the panel will be, our moderator will introduce the panelists and then each of them will have about 10 minutes to present and discuss their work. Then there'll be some time for panelists to dialogue before opening it up to questions from the audience. So please feel free to add questions to the Q&A box during the event, and we'll, we will select as many as we can within the allotted time for panelists to answer after their presentations and dialogue. Also, please note we have live captioning available during this event. Uh, to enable it on most Zoom platforms, you can look for the CC or closed captioning button on the menu of the meeting controls at the bottom of your Zoom screen and simply click on that button to view the captions. Some viewers may also need to select show, supply, show subtitle after clicking the CC button. Um, and in the chat now, um, our team will be sharing some links to some related Pacific Islander programs and opportunities. And I'll say a bit more about those at the end of the panel, but just in case um, we miss you before then, you can find the uh, links in the chat now. And with that, um, I'll introduce you to the moderator for today's panel, our Pacifica Mellon Dissertation Fellow, Tangerine Vey. 
Uh, Tangerine Bay is a PhD candidate in education, culture, and society at the University of Utah. Their research focuses on the development of pedagogies that promote critical consciousness and healing, spiritual activism, and community building. A central focus of these pedagogical approaches is creating teaching and learning environments that take on a playful spirit that can facilitate dialogue across difference. Within this approach, art making broadly defined becomes a means for both generating personally meaningful creations, as well as for engaging in collective processes of meaning making as participants explore the personal and sy systemic complexities of current social issues. Their dissertation titled Spiritual Activism and Activist Education, Examining the Spirit of Transformative Pedagogies is a critical participatory action research project wherein the research conducted is in community with those for whom the research is intended. In this project, a team of activist educators utilizes queer phenomenology to trace the presence of underlying oppressive forces that can manifest in activist approaches to teaching and learning and seeks to turn spiritual activists and decolonial ideologies as guides for undoing and creating anew their educational practices in an ongoing process of studied change. Tangerine is also an artist and gardener who enjoys creating visual art on paper and canvas as well as in living landscapes. And they delight in making kombucha and taking care of their three cats with their partner. So mahalo Tanji, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Maile, for that introduction. Um, I, too, am coming to you today from my home in Kokorin, which is the Eastern Shoshone name, the place we now call Salt Lake City. Um, I am a light-skinned biracial genderqueer person with short curly hair. Um, I'm wearing a white button-up shirt with little sharks on it. And um, in my background, I have um, a bookshelf and a picture hanging up behind me. Um, our panel today is titled Oceanic Fluidarities, Gender and Sexuality in Pacific Islander Diasporas. Diasporas. And now let me introduce our panelists today. Dr. Stephanie Nohalani Tevis is Kanaka Maoli and is an Associate Professor of Women's Studies at the University of Hawaii at Manoa, where she teaches courses on indigenous feminisms and queer theory. Tevis is a is author of Defiant Indigeneity, The Politics of Hawaiian Performance and co-editor of Native Studies Keywords. Co-presenting, we have Lennon Pereira and Dr. Keith Camacho. Lennon Pereira is a case manager in a re-entry services program for adults on felony probation. He has previously mentored the case and case managed gang identified minors and transitional aged youth in a gang intervention and diversion program in Ventura County. From Carson, California, Lennon had early gang affiliations with ethnic Samoans and Polynesians in the Harbor area and South Bay of Los Angeles. He is also an army veteran with four years active duty and four years on the National Guard in Los Alamitos, California. He is also a former meth addict who struggled with alcoholism and who entered the Dream Center Discipleship Program as a diversion from the extensive incarceration and has been sober since July 1st, 2012. Keith Camacho is a professor of Asian American Studies at the University of California, Los Angeles. He is also author of Sacred Men, Law, Torture, and Retribution in Guam, the editor of Repin, Pacific Islander Youth and Native Justice, and the former senior editor of Amerasia Journal. Elsewhere, Professor Camacho has facilitated educational workshops for the College of Micronesia, the Cutterin Chamorro Foundation, the National Pacific Islander Education Network, the Northern Marianas Humanities Council, and the Poly Strong Leadership Foundation, among other organizations. Dr. Fui Fui Lepe Numutolu is a Tongan scholar, storyteller, and community organizer. She received her doctorate from the Comparative Ethnic Studies Department at the University of California, Berkeley, in 2019, and she is a 2021 UC President's postdoctoral fellow at the Department of Native American Studies at the University of California, Davis. She is working on two book manuscripts, The Mana of Tongan Every Day, Tongan Grief and Mourning, Patriarchal Violence and Remembering Raw, 
and a collection of creative nonfiction narratives titled Looking for Hine Nui Te po, Searching for Our Mother. Hui is a historian for the Soteria Te Land Trust and Urban Indigenous Women-Led Land Trust that works to rematriate indigenous lands. She hosts the popular Sogoria Teilan Trust Seeing, Seeding Hope speaker series. And in addition, she hosts the radio segment From Moana Nui to California, Indigenous Women's Stories of Land on KPFA 94.1 FM. In fall 2020, she co-curated with San Francisco poet, poet laureate Kim Shuck, our Moana Nui, We Are Pacific Islander Studies, a literary event sponsored by the San Francisco Public Library that featured and honored the life and work of Albert Wind. This literary project, as well as the upcoming fall 2021 symposium, examining the collaborations between the Black Panther Party and the Polynesian Panthers in New Zealand, are conversations curated by Dr. Numatolu, and they are a part of a series of projects advocating and expanding the scope of Pacific Islands studies in the California Ethnic Studies curriculum. It is my pleasure to welcome each of our panelists today, and I will now turn the time over to Dr. Tevis. Welcome. Aloha. Uh, so I could just start now? Yeah? Okay. <laughs> well, mahalo, aloha kakayaka. I'm gonna jump over all the mahalos, and I do have many of them, but Miley said it so well. Uh, aloha kako, I am um, Nohelani Tevis. I am a tan-ish femme presenting cis wahine uh, in her early 40s. I'm coming to you live from the University of Hawaii at Manoa. Um, I'm actually in my office. Uh, behind me is a file cabinet and many ruffled papers and books. I want to just make kind of like two critical points and maybe we could talk about it later. One is that we need to queer our thinking about Pacific Island diaspora. And I'll talk about what that means. And number two, we need to be critical of always correlating non-heteronormative Pacific gender and sexualities within the Western framework of LGBTQ. So before today, I was thinking a lot about what I was gonna say. And I thought I would just start by saying a little bit about how I came to this place of research and thinking. So I grew up in Hawaii my entire life until I was about 25 when I left to go to Michigan for graduate school. And it was there that I actually learned how important my queerness was. And I was gay for a very long time, <laughs> but it was there where I learned how linked my queerness was to my indigeneity and how they co-created one another. And I came to this realization by making community with Pacific Islanders and Native Americans who are also sort of queer in some way. And if it were not for these relationships, I wouldn't have come to understand how linked queerness is with indigeneity as a kind of mobility with really deep mana, even when living in the diaspora. So something that I wanna emphasize is that re these relationships that we create in diaspora as Pacific Islanders, and I am, back home now, but I still feel myself in a kind of diaspora, we have to understand that these relationships are just matter profoundly for Pacific Islander diasporic indigeneity, wherever we are. Uh, so like a few years ago, I began to think about how Pacific Islander indigeneity is constrained by discourses that always privilege native presences on the land, in contrast to living in diaspora. And these uh, privileges impact how we belong and see one another. Now in, in the Hawaiian context, there's huge emphasis, of course, especially now on economic dislocation, but I really want us to think about how deep our indigenous histories are to movement and travel. And so how frequently we've traveled and that we can intellectually travel as well and that within Pacific Island studies, I think we have to engage queer of color critique and queer indigenous studies more. Because when we queer our understanding of diaspora, we question the underlying logic that attaches native people only to land. And we also more importantly, um, question the perceived normalcy of heteropatriarchal nationalism. 
This allows us to refuse a perceived heterosexuality of our ancestors and recall and create different kinds of belonging that extend beyond um, filial or biological blood relationships. And we have many examples of this throughout our communities, I believe. Um, Native feminists have talked about this, such as Miley Arvin, who is here, Kehaulani Kawinua. They've taught us and talked about how um, Pacific Islander women, and in this specific case, Hawaiian women, are always pressured to reproduce with Native men to strengthen our bloodlines and rebuild our communities. And this is a problematic emphasis, right? Uh, most recently, Heoli Osorio has critiqued how traditional notions of the Hawaiian nation and patriotism actually uncritically replicate the heteronormativity and exclusionary violences of the settler state. Uh, further, you know, if we wanna think about different kinds of critical pedagogies, we should all recall that, you know, our godmother, Haunani K. Trask, wrote about being slyly reproductive too, right? Noting that poetry, writing, and activism are all ways that we can put forth mana for future generations that don't rely on heterosexual biological reproduction. So, and then alongside this querying and thinking and talking about diaspora, we also, as I was explaining, for my own experience, we have to connect with the native nations in which we were living. Um, in this way, our diaspora can come together to recreate indigenous life and share it, honoring our homelands, but also honoring a new place that doesn't displace the nations of the places that we're in, but instead allows us to create more um, expansive and dynamic forms of indigenous belonging that themselves can become queer. And, and I believe by making connections with Native nations, this allows us to feel more connected to our homelands or our senses of Pacific Islander indigeneity. This then also refuses the idea that we're disconnected completely from our communities, from our homelands. Um, it refuses heteropatry that wants to negate the different relations we're creating, and it breaks up the colonial mindset that we're somehow incomplete as islanders if we're not at home. So in this way, it kind of breaks us out of always emphasizing return narratives and allows us instead to think about the multiple roots and roots that we use to foster our indigeneity. So when we think about queerness in the Pacific diaspora then, it gives us actually an opportunity to rethink what we want Pacific culture to look like, rather than always worrying about what it, that it doesn't look the way that it used to. And to my second point is that um, we all know, Pacific Islanders know that we have lots of forms of gender and relationships, sexual relationships that precede and will exceed the state and colonial power. But, Solely relying on these forms of relations to authenticate our current um, identities or formations that we might take up is not the only way to kind of pursue our freedom, in, you know, to kind of put it plainly. We should open up and focus on the different ways that we can be and relate with one another consensually and not only need a pre-colonial um, evidence to validate us today. All those, those relations certainly are sources of great pride and fight against all the violence of colonization and Christianization. Um, so I'm not trying to invalidate the roles of the Mahu, the Papafine, the Takatapui, the Fakalaiti, but I'm calling for kind of like an expansion of these histories to consider how we, um, what kinds of relations we actually wanna have, maybe relationships that don't even have names yet, right? So. I believe this is necessary to um, imagine queer islander genealogies that extend across place and time. Um, I don't think we need to rely on truth, truth or proof of evidence that we always existed. I think we always do. Um, for me, I always return to the brilliance of Teresia Teewa, the way she talked about the native as being fluid and complex and, absolute, and not absolutely bounded. I think we need to bring queer studies into the way that we think about how her work was so powerful as well. As you know, Native feminists remind us 
the sovereignty that we have over our bodies and over our communities starts in the home. And so in that home, you know, we are just everyday things that we do can kind of open up our thinking and the way that we talk about diaspora. Uh, we need to look to the margins, to the edges of the ocean to affirm that queer islanders exist or might exist in different ways that we're not ready for. I think the future generation is showing us a lot of exciting things and we have to be open to them and let them be, you know what I'm saying? Um, and that we need to let them have space to tell their stories and we have to also um, tell different stories. Uh, we can't tell all of them, obviously, but I believe that when we acknowledge our varied histories of movement, we can reimagine what kind of futures we want for ourselves um, in the home or you know, in the homeland or in the diaspora. And I think that's my time. Mahalo. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Tevez. Um, we will now turn the time over to uh, Lennon and Keith Camacho. Uh, mahalo and thank you, uh, uh, Lani and uh, Hafede Tanji, Hafede uh, Tata Pacific. Hello. Everybody in uh, Pacific region, the diaspora, et cetera. My name is Keith uh, Camacho. Um, what's that? Um, I am a light-skinned Chamorro person who lives and works in what the native Tongva called Tavangar, also known as the city of Los Angeles. A shout out to the Tongva peoples of this uh, great place. Uh, I'm also five feet tall and I'm wearing a black shirt. And my Zoom background has the image of um, a forest, uh, a green forest area with a parking lot nearby. And so it gives me pleasure to uh, join you. I'll talk for about four minutes and then uh, my colleague and friend, uh, Len Paraira would, would join me thereafter. <clears throat> and given our emphasis, and I, oh, before I begin, I also wanna thank everybody, Tanji, Angela, Hoku, uh, Fui Fui, Maile, uh, Daniel, everyone for, for putting together this amazing uh, series. I watched the earlier one. Uh, with David, Vince, and company. Great stuff, and so I'm excited to be here. Thank you again. So uh, given our emphasis on uh, pedagogy, uh, Pacific studies, gender sexuality, uh, me and Len want to talk about a class uh, we are teaching right now. Um, as a teacher, I've, I've taught for about over 25 years. I've taught high school. I've taught community college. I've taught um, with and alongside uh, um, nonprofits. Uh, I've taught in churches. I've taught on the street, in the village. And so it gives me great pleasure for me and Len to talk a little bit about our collaboration uh, in this class uh, we call OGs Repping the Hood. OGs Repping the Hood, colon, Indigenous Art, uh, Justice, and Service. And so uh, let me, uh, what I'll do, I'll, I'll, in this course, in, in short form, uh, we feature um, former original gangsters and um, we talk about masculinity, we talk about girl empowerment, we talk about healing transformation, all those different things. Let me read out the description uh, for this class. OGs oh, repping the hood, indigenous art, uh, justice and service. In Oahu, Filipino, Native Hawaiian and Samoan youth gangs often participate in petty crimes as with assault and theft. Elsewhere, the Chamorro youth gangs of Guam frequently manufacture and, dis and circulate methamphetamine, as do the Maori and Pacifica youth gangs of Aotearoa, New Zealand. In doing so, these Pacific Islander youth sometimes appropri appropriate the signs, songs, and swagger of African American gangs in Los Angeles as much as they employ and remake their indigenous notions of belonging, identity, and territory throughout Oceania. One example is the OG or the original gangster, a term that designates authority and demands respect. In Aotearoa, for example, some Samoan youth gangs follow the counsel of their OGs, also known as their Matai or high chiefs. But for me and Len, we ask, Len and myself, we ask, what happens when the OGs leave their gangs? Where do they go? What do they do? In this seminar, we feature the life stories of several original gangsters from California, the complex and fraught processes by which they entered and exited gangs, the liberating manner by which they assert their talents in the arts, counseling, 
music and social work. And the alofa or love or kindness in the Samoan language and the alofa of their cultures that make affirmation, forgiveness, healing, and most vitally service possible. As such, this seminar, Len and myself, our seminar in, in conceptualizing it, we seek to decolonize the pathological lens of law enforcement that represents African-American, Filipino, Native Hawaiian, Samoan, Tongan, and other marginalized youth as deviant and criminal. Our goal is to center the transformative stories about and the many contributions of Pacific Islander, Pacific Islander OGs like my colleague and friend, Len Pereira. And so uh, this is our seminar. It's uh, we only meet um, uh, five times in this 10 week quarter at UCLA. And to give some background in this format, uh, I've taught this course, it's a one, one credit, pass, no pass. And the, be the beautiful aspect of this seminar is it allows me to partner with great people like Len. I've taught uh, similar seminars with public defenders. I've taught seminars with people at the forefront of uh, LGBT organizing in Los Angeles nationally. I've taught this seminar uh, with also other faculty members and others. And so it's, and, and with students. The most recent uh, class I taught was with um, uh, Pilipinx students and their class was called uh, Pilipinx colon activism for a new generation. So I'm really grateful even, even to the university for allowing this one kind of format, this pedagogical format where we can uh, touch on uh, some of these uh, very, very important issues, uh, much of which Lani and others have already shared. And so I'm now gonna turn my time over to Len and, and Len, uh, please uh, welcome and, and join us. And you can say more about your entry point into this, into the course and a relationship or collaboration and the many great things you bring to the students at UCLA. Uh, so thank you, Tanji, uh, Fafatai, Sidus Masi, everybody. Hello, Falaba. Thank you, Dr. Keith. Um, my name is Len Pereira, it's Lennon Pereira. Please um, call me Len. Um, so great to be here. I really quickly want to thank uh, Tanji um, for your patience and helping me get um, here to fellowship with all of you guys. I want to thank um, Myla for the follow-up. And I want to say a quick hello to Sister Fui, who I have not seen in some time. It's great to reconnect with you, especially in this space. Uh, my name is Len Pereira. I am a brown-skinned um, native, I'm on. Um, if I'm on my tippy toes, I'll be six feet tall. I'm currently wearing my Easter shirt of uh, the pink pastel tones, and I have a burgundy cap on for the uh, little touch of the OG uh, Marvin Gaye feel, which is what we're going with today. So I um, just want to say mahalo lava to everybody that's here. Um, I've taken on Dr. Keith as a personal mentor because, uh, to be honest with you guys, I don't know many uh, Pacific Islanders and Polynesians with the PhD. And when it came time a few years ago to make some necessary life changes um, uh, and to gain the insight into changing the people who I allow into my life. So that's why I'm grateful to Dr. Keith, uh, Dr. Keith for all these opportunities, especially uh, the focus of our class, which is called OGs Repping the Hood. Um, the class was great. We've had our first session. We just had our first session. And that's when I had my opportunity to share with the students. And the focus of that first session, uh, we posed the question of identity to the students. Um, it was a question that I posed and particularly identity around the age group of adolescence and puberty. Because in my personal experience, I, struggled with my identity on a personal level around that time, the ages of 12, 13 years old, you know, middle school age. And if I had the right uh, guidance at that time as a youth, then I don't think that I would have been attracted to the gang lifestyle. Um, I chose, I put on that identity because, um, I was, you know, fearful and that time in a person's uh, life is, you know, the, the growth and the change and the hormones that we, we all experience, the acne on your face, the insecurity, the fear, you're trying to figure out what group do you belong to, right, in a school, in a social setting. So 
I made the unfortunate mistake of identifying with um, the group that is socially responsible for a lot of negativity that we as a community are, you know, trying to undo, unlearn, and reteach and relearn, right? Better approaches, uh, better lifestyles. So identity was the main focus of that first session and, and was what I want to share with the rest of my time is what I do these days. Um, I've worked in gang intervention programs in the city of Oxnard for um, basically from the ages of 12 to 25, which is transitional age youth, right? Tay, the Tay population. Going into the, uh, the juvenile halls and going into uh, the two county jails in Ventura County. And I'm only able to do that because I'm contracted to the county. I'm not a county employee because of my my unfortunate criminal history. But I still am given these awesome opportunities to, to work with youth and individuals who are just like me. Same upbringing, same home environment, same pressures. And when, I, when I'm sharing with the youth that I do in my, my nine to five during the week and with the youth that me and Dr. Keith are teaching in this course is when you connect them to a strong sense of identity as early as possible, like you can be from Compton, you can be from Long Beach, you can be from South Lake, you can be from Oakland, you know, but you don't have to be destructive. You can embrace the lowrider culture, you can embrace the hip hop culture, right? But it doesn't have to be negative, it doesn't have to be sexist, you know? So we don't, the, that is the main point that I wanna bring home to uh, the kids and young adults on my caseload and the students at UCLA during this time for the classes, really pushing that issue about connecting with them, connecting them to cultural alternatives, religious alternatives, if that's appealing to them, anything that's positive, art, music. So the, uh, the other speakers of the course, and there's also female OGs. You know, we're gonna have a Samoan sister from the Bay Area from SF. She's gonna uh, uh, share for one of the sessions. So we are going to address, um, you know, different gender and identity roles within, you know, past and, and present gang lifestyles and, and the like. So um, that's pretty much what has been the focus of the class. I'm, I'm excited to hear everyone else's talk story. Once again, I'm grateful to be here. And thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Lynn and uh, Dr. Keith. Um, and now we will turn the time over to Dr. Nimitoli. Oops, sorry about that. Sorry about that, everybody. Um, wow. You know, Brother Lynn, hey. Avalayatu, it's great to see you. It's great to see you. You know, brothers and sisters, uh, I just really want to say how humbled I am. Really, how humbled I am to be here with all of you today. I also recognize, firstly, I want to recognize that um, I'm actually uh, zooming into you from uh, Lishan Ohlone land. This is occupied, unceded Ohlone lands that I'm, on, that I'm currently on. It's also the home of our beloved Black Panthers, brothers and sisters. It's a land of great histories and resistance. And I'm really, and I'm really humbled to be on this land, also known uh, as Oakland, California. I'm a little bit off my topic after listening to the beautiful presentations. And I also just think about the histories that brought us together, uh, Brother Lynn. And it's really, I really wanna give a big shout out to our brothers and sisters, our brothers and sisters uh, behind bars at this time. It's, uh, I also wanna thank the, the great Kumu, uh, Kawi Peralta, also my sister, Lord Nguyen who brought me into that work. Uh, of working and doing ceremony with our brothers, our Pacific Islander and Native American brothers and sisters who are behind bars. 
I want to say thank you so much, brothers and sisters. Thank you for believing in me. Because, uh, you know, you know, brothers and sisters, I say this because there's a lot of uh, shame in it that it took me 13 years to finish my PhD dissertation. But I say that because of the shame and because I also want to, I want to, I want to proudly uh, thank so many people. First and foremost, I also want to thank uh, the wonderful, really, the beloved scholars who are on the panel today for an important part, Keith Camacho, Myla Arman, Lonnie Tavis. You know, for the young scholars, the young uh, Oceania scholars who are watching, I know I have very little time, but the gratitude is an important part of you too, uh, Brother Len. Gratitude is such an important part. It is an essential part of our Pacific Islander culture, of my own Tongan culture. That I want to say that during the many, many times when I fell down, I couldn't get back up in academia, when I didn't feel like I belonged, it was actually the work of these brothers and sisters who brought me back up, who said, hey, believe in yourself, believe in your ancestral calling and come back to academia to tell the stories, to tell the stories of our ancestors and to tell the stories of refusing colonization. So I wanna say thank you so much. And I wanted to, uh, that was just a little change of my, my talk. So, and especially after listening to all the important and beautiful presentations. Brothers and sisters, uh, I just want to show uh, three images. My presentation. Um, my presentation is called Taumiva on Occupied Indigenous Land, Protecting the Sacred as Tongan and Oceanian Feminist Practices. What I wanna show is some of my research, and I also wanna show uh, some images from the thriving, right? Thriving and, and the alive uh, movements here in California, and especially here in Huchen, which is the Ohlone name for Oakland or the East Bay, uh, to, to protect the sacred, right? And, these, and what I wanna show is that the work to protect the sacred, brothers and sisters, is actually a work to, uh, uh, excuse me, to fight for our self-determination, okay? And this is the work to protect the sacred along with our indigenous brothers and sisters um, on their land that we currently call their, our new homes. So the first image that I wanted to show was an image actually that, was, uh, that came out in 2009. It was uh, photographs of Tongans, of Tongan nests, right? Photographs of Tongan nests. Uh, that were shown in the LA Times. The photographs were uh, during Prop 8, right? And so let me just let me just read a little bit about Prop 8, uh, everybody, because I know that not everybody is, is familiar with Prop 8. Okay, so uh, Prop 8, please forgive me, let me just go here really quickly, okay? Prop 8 was a California ballot proposition and a state constitutional amendment intended to ban same-sex marriage as to institutionalize the boundaries that marriage is an institution that should only be with a man and a woman. Uh, Prop 8 passed in the November 2000, uh, 2008 California state elections and was later overturned in court. The proposition was produced and financially supported by opponents of women's rights and LGB rights, such as the Mormon church one of the world's most wealthiest, powerful religious institutions, and one of the largest land-owning institutions in the Pacific and in California. The US-based Mormon church and other neoliberal institutions exponentially rose to prominence in Tonga and throughout the Pacific after the US military occupation uh, during World War II. Thus Tongans and other Pacific Islanders um, hold the global record of baptisms and conversions into the Mormon church, the highest in the 20th and 21st centuries, right? In this particular image right here, um, uh, I also write, the mainstream media's imagery of Tongans was enticing. The big brown bodies of our Tongan men, our Tongan brothers were militarized and used as weapons to police Mormon temples from Oakland, San Diego, Fresno, reaching all the way to LA. Tongan male bodies were deployed as borders to draw lines of separation from the crowds of gay rights activists and ordinary community members that refused the hate. 
The images of Tonganes were depicted matter of factly as if they were true, as if Tonganes is a spatiality devoid of gay, queer, and the feminine. The mainstream media, the mainstream media fed us male uh, rage vying on a national stage against a small and Jewish lesbian woman. This image, this image, brothers and sisters, still breaks my heart. What was not shown was the bodies of Tongan women. Tongan women that held the knowledges that recognized that Leiti and women are the true warriors doing the work of Tawi Fanua, doing the work of Puke Puke Fanua at the front lines of our Tongan communities. What was not shown was the many bodies of Tongan queer and Leiti and the bodies of Tongan men that refused, that refused the colonial institution of heteropatriarchy. In addition, in addition, brothers and sisters, what was not shown in these images was the faces of the wealthy white male Mormon church leaders issuing the orders that specifically targeted Tongan and Pacific Islander communities, calling them to the front lines while they sat in the safety of their own homes behind their desks in Salt Lake City, Utah. So one thing that I forgot, uh, brothers and sisters, because I got my fun, I, or I got really, um, you know, I, I became uh, really, really, uh, I was so moved by the presentations before me as I forgot to just share a, a thesis statement, uh, just a short one, not to get too uh, academic on everybody here. But I just, I, I, I actually talked about uh, uh, white, uh, in my research, I talk about how white terror, white terror is a, a patriarchal, uh, is a, is a patriarchal violence uh, that is introduced to Tonganess um, through several different contact moments. Um, and so I'm, it's the white terror actually that I'm arguing, uh, these images that I argue is that these white terror from our colonizers is what our Tongan brothers here are internalizing and also performing. And so, Perhaps to help my point here is I talk actually about, uh, you know, one of a, a definitive moment in Tongan history, right? It's a definitive moment where our, our His Highness King Tafa Ahau Tibo the first, right? He, in order to show that he has, be, that he is worthy of this new role as a, you know, as a king uh, uh, that is actually created by the British colonizers and the, 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 the Methodist missionaries, Right, coming together, these types of power uh, coagulate to, to bring him into power and authority. That one of his performances that he must perform, that he must uh, show um, his conversion into Christianity, is actually violence against women and the desecration of the sacred. And to tell this the story, uh, I. I, I actually am going to just read uh, uh, a brothers and sisters just because it also gets a little too emotional. I just really also wanna make my point. Okay, and so this particular version that I read is actually from uh, the Tongan historians, uh, Siona La Gefu from his important book, uh, Church and State in Tonga. Okay, so Dava Ahau wanted to test the validity and power of the old gods and to discover by experience whether Jehovah was the true God. So, you know, he goes with Peter B, one of the, the newer converts, they go to a sacred site, right? They go to what we might say is a temple now. And in the sacred site, they encounter, of course, the Dauhi or the, the steward of the sacred land. And the steward of the sacred land or the Dauhi is an elder woman. Right, and so I wanted to put up this photo. Of course, this is not a photo of her, but this might be a photo of how she might have looked like. Because also in our Tongan traditional cultures, we did as women have tattoo, tattoos, tatows, that were also uh, banned and criminalized by the Christians. Okay, and so what happens to prove his conversion and to prove uh, his, that, and to prove his conversion into this new role, Dalfa how does this. Delpha Hau had prepared a great cup of kava. The kava cup was filled and, hand, and handed by Delpha Hau to the, to the priestess. 
And while her face was turned upwards in drinking of its contents, or in other words, while her, her face was turned, turned up in prayer, right? In prayer, the most vulnerable um, uh, uh, position that, uh, that we as Tongans can take, that we as indigenous people can take. Dalfa Ahau struck her with a great blow on her forehead. He had her rolling on the ground. Then he gave her another blow and raising a shout of victory, called out that the God was slain. So brothers and sisters, I really also, I really wanna talk about how this moment also is a moment of internalizing, internalizing white terror. What we see our great ancestor, and I also wanna with all due respect, our great ancestor, Delphi Haudu, was to internalize and to perform white terror. The last image that I wanna show is an image of young people, right? Our Tongan and Oceania are, are, are relatives from Mauna Nui. The first image that I, I, I wanted to talk about, and this is all of us coming together, coming together. The first image uh, um, is at the West Berkeley Shaw Mount. Um, let's see, this, this image right here. Is at the worst Berkeley Shaw Mound. The Ohlone is the oldest Ohlone sacred site and listed 11th most endangered historic places uh, in the US by the National Trust for Historic Places. We were Dauhiva, right? We were Dauhiva. So what we were doing is we were doing a Tongan prodigal. To be to Dauhiva is this is our Tongan prodigal. This is what it means to be Tongan. Uh, Va also is a, is a cosmology that is shared between all of us throughout Mauna Nui and also with our indigenous relatives here in Turtle Island, right? That all our relationalities, all the intimacies at the root is the feminine, at the root is the sacred, right? So this work uh, 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 to Dao Hiva, I, I argue in the research and also in the, the you know, within this particular presentation uh, is actually, uh, is, is also our way for us as Tongan and peoples of Mauna Nui, our work to Dahiva with the indigenous people of the land, the stewards of the land, to help them, to stand with them, excuse me, to follow their leadership, to protect their sacred, is a work that helps us to return back to our own respective Fonoa. Right, so this first uh, picture, uh, this first image, by the way, it also shows our Dahiva of our Kanaka Maoli relatives in Hawaii protecting their sacred site, Mauna Kea, from desecration. We acknowledge that many of the Kia'i or protectors of Mauna Kea are Wahine, women, and Mahu, queer. Also, in, in this particular circle, you see our Dahiva with our Mar Maori relatives in Aotearoa, New Zealand. We are flying the Tino Rana Tiro Tanga flag or Maori self determination. We are standing with the young Maori warriors, uh, pa Pania, um, uh, uh, pa excuse me, Ma I just forgot her last name here. The young Ma Maori warriors, the stewards of Ihu Matau. Also, our circle here uh, shows our Dahiva with our West Papuan relatives and the free. West Papua movement that are fighting for the protection and freedom of their land and their people from multinational corporations and empires that includes the United States. The last a photo right here with the, the, the wonderful young women that you see uh, carrying that beautiful banner. Indigenous Ocean is a picture of Olo, Indigenous Oceanian Queer and Feminist Organization, composed of women, uh, women identified from Melanesia, Micronesia, and Polynesia. This was the response. This was a community response to Prop 8, right? Uh, these were women coming together, refusing the mainstream preoccupation that our Oceania and our Pacific Islander community centered the colonial values of homophobia and heteropatriarchy. This was to refuse that and to also redefine us, redefine who we are, that we are much more than the smallness using our great ancestor at Billy Hawafa. Homophobia is a smallness. It is a colonial smallness of our people. This photo, this last photo that you see here was taken at the Dyke March in San Francisco in 2009. And the photo of the young people, so beautiful, uh, brothers and sisters. That photo always brings so much tears to my eyes. Taken in 2015 in our climate change march. Our contingent from Oceania walked alongside and behind 
uh, the Ohlone and the California Indians that led the march. We, we were so, so humbled to be part of the indigenous block. The big banner that are carried by the young Marshallese climate change warriors was inspired by banners created by our relatives in the climate warriors uh, movement in the Pacific and also Maori women elders marching in the front lines to protect their land against Monsanto and other neoliberal institutions that desired the desecration of the land, water and ocean. The image of the Marshallese youth group under the leadership, by the way, of Marshallese women elders that you don't see in this photograph, remind us that as peoples of Mauna Nui, as peoples of Oceania, our work to protect our mother earth is a work to, is a work to protect the sacred. And it is an Oceanian feminist project that is at the core of reclaiming and remembering our mana. And this work is at the center of our work for our self-determination. Malo, uh, Malo, everybody. Please forgive me, I, I, I bet I, I went over time. Um, thank you very much, Dr. Nimitolu. Um, could we, yeah, there we go, thank you. Um, so now we're going to move into opening up a bit of a conversation. So thank you all for your, your individual panel presentations. Um, we are going to be taking questions from the audience, but before we do, um, we wanted to give an opportunity for you all to speak into each other's work a little bit. Clearly, um, there is a deep respect among all of the panelists here and for the work that you do. And so, um, First, we want to start with just, you know, kind of broadly speaking, uh, what reflections do you have on each other's work? How are you, how are you thinking with or taking up and understanding each other's work? I um, just want to say beautiful presentations from Dr. Lani and Dr. Fui. Um, I am um, relatively new to academia, so then when I have the opportunity to attend and fellowship, um, like in this um, presence today, I feel like a young student and I just soak everything up. I try to absorb, take notes, um, because such powerful information, um, and I just am just benefiting on a personal level. <laughs> Wow, you know, I for me, perhaps if I if I can, if I could just uh, what I want to say though is for us, you know, the the silence is the silence is is a sacred, right? And it comes really, and I thank you so much, Brother Lynn, uh, because I, I know that and I recognize that so many people are, are going to be viewing and are viewing our, our presentations, and that often the silence in academia is always uncomfortable. I. I actually want to say that our silence, you know, for me, uh, our brothers and sisters and relatives who are watching, it really is, it's just, it's a great humility. There's so much I want to say. And I think that that's really what's going on with our silences, if we perhaps could theorize it a little, because there is so much we want to say. You know, usually a specific people, I mean, I think about uh, my own role in academia, the marginalization, wow, to finally be in a panel. Uh, with Mauna Nui uh, uh, activists, community leaders, and scholars. It's so overwhelming. It's also so humbling that I am like you when, that perhaps then I also feel that my role is, my role is also to learn. And that's exactly what I did today. Keith, you're a great theorist. Lonnie, you're a great theorist. You guys have several books. I, I'm still writing, you know, I have an excuse. I'm still writing a book.
I think just in short form to, to um, um, address Tanji's question, in short form, I think pedagogically, the challenge for me is always like, how can we best communicate um, a lot of issues shared in this panel, a lot of things going on in our region, locally, etc. And the biggest challenge is not simply a, a kind of uh, pedagogy of, of what might constitute things specific, but it's, it's kind of moving into the intimate and uncomfortable um, in terms of the kind of things we, we engage. So uh, on the one hand, you know, given the panel's uh, makeup, uh, Kanaka Maoli, Chukis, Samoan, Tongan, these kinds of things are very important, but it's also very important to challenge how even those peoples, our people who make up those communities, how they might understand themselves and others, right? Um, as Lani and, and Fui and, and uh, Len and Tanji mentioned earlier, uh, we live in a global world and globalizing world. And, and, and so it's a balancing act in kind of like, as Len put it, identity affirmation for young people, but also the kind of critical thinking skills that can um, you know, um, maintain a, an open-mindedness and empathy for, for each other and, and, um, and for the world always. And that's a challenge, that's, that's a labor. Right. And so I think pedagogically, it's, you know, as, as teachers, as people who work alongside a lot of good people out there, it's really uh, always, and as Teresia, in the spirit of Teresia, and I'll paraphrase Terry here, it's always a, an effort, a labor to recalibrate our vocabulary, to always recalibrate our, um, our positionality and, and our teaching, always. And that's, that's Terry. So yeah, that's, uh, that's what I would say in short form in terms of the, the challenges uh, with our teaching. Should we try to answer the question that's been posed in the chat? Yeah, uh, yeah we, can, we can do that. Um, uh, I just wanted to give you, uh, Dr. Tavis, an, an opportunity to speak into that if you wanted to before we move to the questions from the audience. But it sounds like you're ready to answer questions from the audience. Yeah, no, I mean, I was truthfully so moved by everything. I had a hard time, you know, stepping forward and thinking about the silence that Fui's mentioning. But I think the question that's in the chat speaks to that too. Um, so, it's funny, like I actually, like I said, I was queer, gay, whatever, for a very long time. And, um, you know, in um, your native, sorry, you're gonna uh, read the question. Yeah, can we read the question? So then I don't, I don't believe all the audience can see it. So I'll read it real quick so that everyone knows what you're speaking into and then we'll go from there. So um, this is a question from Manu, uh, Manu Malo um, and it's for Lani and Fui. So Dr. Tevis and Dr. Uh, Nimatolu, how have you navigated your intersectional identity of being both a Pacific Islander and a lesbian or queer? Do you live them separately uh, out of rele relevancy and necessity? Do you ever have to deny a part of you in certain spaces? Are there ever occasions that you can live them fully integrated and be your complete authentic self? And how can we support each other in the Oceania diaspora, diaspora here on the US continent? So many questions there, but go ahead. I mean, just quickly to that, I think um, it's just, it's always uneven. And I think a lot of maybe queer identified people feel this at different times because of the way that homophobia operates so pervasively, even when we're in spaces with people who are similarly identified. Um, the violence of homophobia and heteropatriarchy always somehow emerges. And then for myself, actually coming home, moving back to Hawaii, and um, now as a parent, I encounter so much more personally fear and homophobia because I, as a parent, I'm moving into all these like straight, straight spaces so much more frequently than I ever did before. And I, I be being just honest, like all the time, I'm you know you encounter all these assumptions, and I have the privilege of those assumptions because of being you know femme presenting but at the same time it's just this sort of constant reminder that you almost forget when you're always in queer space is how straight our seemingly straight our communities perceive us all to be and it's just so frequent even in academic spaces so like this is a very particular um 
you know, special Zoom environment where we can maybe feel safer than other times. But I think it's something that's taken for granted a lot um, within Pacific Islander communities. And that's why, as Fui mentioned and everybody else mentioned, the education that we have to undergo amongst ourselves uh, in our most intimate spaces is so crucial. And these are hard conversations and there is a lot of shame. And it, it's sad that it really doesn't go away, um, but you figure out how to manage it in different ways. That's a that's a really great uh, uh, question there, Marlo. Uh, thank you so much for it, and also uh, thanks so much for your answer there, uh, Sister Lani. Uh, that's a really good question because I have to, I have to be very honest with you, uh, 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 Marlo. Is that I, I don't use those terms to define myself, um, and and I have my own reasons for that, you know, and I, I have my own reasons for that. What I can say is that what I am and perhaps my gender uh, and sexualities is Tongan, is Tongan. And it's perhaps, uh, it would be to stand with the, the sacred Tongan elder. And it's to say that our, my sexuality is very, very fluid. It is like our, our Moana and it's like our Fanua. The navigation of these words, you know, um, I was just in a conversation also with, perhaps I, I would use the word queer more than I would use the word lesbian. I don't think that just defines my, my gender or sexualities. But I, I, I would return back to something you also talked about, Lani, earlier, um, about this, the interconnectedness, right? The interconnectedness between your uh, Kanaka Mali identity, your indigeneity uh, with queerness, right? That I've also heard Kumuhina talk about. Uh, Kumuhina is in her question, she says that in the West, there's always this preoccupation with her to identify herself as trans or as mahu. And she always says, even her own desires do not fit into that. And even her, her dreams about who she is and who she is do not fit into those smallness of the, those boundaries. And with all due respect, uh, Malo, with all due respect to the great work you do, I'm right there with you for our communities, but I don't define, I don't define myself by those terms. I, I do define myself as Tongan and as a daughter of Moana Nui. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, the next question is from Hokulani Aikau. And it is, my question is for Len. How do you help young people see ways of being that uh, do not rely on sexism and homophobia? Very good question. Thank you. Um, to answer that, I'll draw on a little bit of my um, history and experience um, within the lens that I'm bringing to our fellowship today, and that's the, coming from the lifestyle of the gang culture. And in that culture, it's full of homophobia. It's full of sexism. And at worst, I was a participant. And at best, I was indifferent to the LGBTQ population. Now that I um, have uh, progressed from that toxicity, right? It's a very good question because at first it had to start with me as an individual before you can teach it to someone else, right? It, the identity um, that is strong within a person is they're going to be less susceptible to outside and negative influences, right? Like the gang culture. Um, if I was queer and I identified myself as such um, from the earliest days of my life, but I had a strong sense of identity. If it wasn't coming from the home, then hopefully in school or somewhere in my neighboring communities, wherever that would be, then I, like the question that's posed, um, I would have had a strong support system and been strong as an individual to, uh, to rise above those challenges and those, those setbacks that seem to be in every aspect of 
pretty much life in this society as we see it today, right? The transphobia and the sexism. So, and that's your question, whether there be kids in the class that we're teaching at UCLA or the people on my caseload, I, I do have some clients who um, live in gang neighborhoods, but because they identify as gay, they're afraid to come out of their house. And I had to put on my case management hat and go over there and do everything within the limits of my power to provide services for this youth, you know, with the extra challenges of, um, of, of, of that person being queer. So it's connecting people to their ethnic culture primarily. You know, in the county that I work in, it is predominantly Hispanic. And just reminding them of their rich culture and history. And on the occasion when I'm blessed to get a Polynesian or Pacific Islander uh, youth on my caseload, and really drilling home the culture, the, 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 the identity that exists in our culture and in, in our people. You know, like I said earlier, um, you know, hey, you can be from Carson, you can be from Long Beach, you know, and, and be proud of where you come from, be proud of who you are in all different aspects, you know, e even in how you identify as a person, but you don't have to be destructive. And as I, I, I seem to be um, saying that almost like on a weekly basis, especially when I go into the county jail, you could be from Oxnard, you can be from whatever society deems to be the hood or the ghetto, those are archaic terms, if you remember those, right? But you don't have to push that. You don't have to push that line. You don't have to push that agenda. And the, uh, it may be more challenging, challenging for someone to plug into uh, Latinx art or, or, or groups or, or spoken word or low riders, car clubs, whatever they may be. Right for Pacific Islanders and for our people, um, coming into spaces like this, pursuing a higher education, despite what your home life looks like. Right, so I guess to answer the question, that's in, in in summation would be connecting a person with their community and cultural identity, and having a strong supportive system. That's how that's how somebody can rise above, rise above their challenges. Great, thank you. Um, do we have another question from the audience? Angie, can, is it okay if you can read that question for us? It just seems like my um, chat is not really working. Um. Okay, yes. Um, so this question is um, for um, Keith and Lynn from Vince Diaz. Um, so relative to the discussion of querying, since the kind of class you are teaching is already non-normative as far as academia goes, what would happen in your work with gang folks if you were to openly broach questions about queer sexuality, especially when it is also a non-normative thing for gangs to be intellectual or academic and um, in, in introspective or soft. Uh, Dr. Keith, you let me go first so that you can have some time to share. I just probably want to just throw a, a, a 60 second answer because this is such a great question. Yes, the gang culture is, if, if there is any um, 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 type of group in existence that needs breakthrough to understand um, uh, queerness and gender fluidity and uh, the, the, the goal and the main points of our, our time today, it would be that culture. It would be that subset because um, in my experience, um, in and outside of this, this group, homosexuality is outlawed. And I'm, I'm using a, a word just to have weight. I know some... Uh, I personally know some individuals, and in this case, they happen to be men, who um, did have sexual preferences that were not cis, and you know, faced the fear of physical retaliation and retribution just because of you know their sexual preferences. So that's a very good question. Um, I got to go back to the support system and, I, and identifying with groups that can support and, and strengthen and, 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 and support a person. Um, if they happen to be um, in difficult situations like that, they're surrounded by a culture and they can't be who they really want to be. Yeah, you're going to need some support from a lot of different areas. 
Thank you, Len. I'll just, I'll just jump in real quickly so that we can address other questions. I also think, thank you, Vince. I think the question also in part um, is, is the framing of the question. Part of it also speaks to what we haven't really talked about, and that is to say uh, structural racism, police racism, military violence, military racism. This is the structure by which you know, an eight-year-old or 12-year-old is walking through the streets of Compton, walking through the streets of Kalihi, right? And, and so, uh, and that, that is part and parcel of the challenges by which youth articulate, express, perform their multiple identities, gender, religious, otherwise. And so I think um, we have to hold that up as a caveat, as a, suspend that for a moment, knowing that, you know, uh, with respect to Samoan or Polynesian or Latinx uh, um, gang, so-called gang communities, that first and foremost is a political resistance to uh, U.S. state violence, sanctioned violence ongoing in California, in Oceania and elsewhere. So I think we need to kind of like not forget that there's that kind of um, uh, social, political, economic realm at play. On the other hand, from my experience with Len and in working with OGs over the years, uh, particularly Samoans, incredible alofa, incredible love. I, I, this, this, the, the, but this, that goes to the pathology of, of the youth today, the pathology around the youth, around, around so-called deviants, and, and more broadly around youth subcultures, right? There's a great literature out there on, on the, the, you know, um, youth, sub, youth as, as really transformative uh, change actors globally. Um, I mean, a lot historically, we can even take a historical lens to this uh, in many, many different cases about the ways in which youth uh, are changing our languages, shape, reshaping our identities. Uh, again, across gender, sexual, religious uh, norms, always, always. And I think, uh, I think with uh, Len and ourselves in this course, we really want to center the alofa of, of Samoans and Palis and other island people, indigenous peoples, the love, the incredible love uh, and struggle and transformation. And that to us is, is the most important uh, trajectory and intervention uh, not to, you know, hold up lightly those other structural challenges. But yeah, I, I think, um, you know, it is something, um, you know, that Len and I and us and the students are working through. But great question. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Um, this next question, it's a little bit long, so bear with me. Um, this is for um, Lani and Fui from Pingan Adu. Um, in Boston, I teach an indigenous film course, and I wonder how we might use the pedagogy embedded in the kind of visual culture that indigenous Pacific Islanders are lately producing in the last few decades. Visual culture that potentially reaches the masses, but that can also be misinterpreted. Uh, so my main question is, how can we clear our pedagogies around sharing indigenous visual culture given the wide sense of authority so many people out there feel they have or have the right to have over visual images. And I ask this in complete gratitude. Um, and uh, as a cisgender, sorry, my chat's moving around. Um, well, you, you have the, the main question there. So if either one of you want to speak into that. Please forgive me, Tanji. I'm, I'm not as a. I, can you please uh, can you say the question one more time? Yeah, um, I'll start with just where the question fully begins because there was a little bit of explanation before that. So, um, how can we clear our pedagogies around sharing indigenous visual culture, given the wide sense of authority so many people out there feel they have or have the right to um, have over visual images? Oh, that's a good question. Well, Lonnie, Lonnie, I. <laughs> Thanks, Bui. That is, I mean, that is always a really, really tough one. And I think we know throughout um, the Pacific and Pacific Islander film or images and things being created by Islanders themselves, there's so much risk with appropriation. And there's a lot of ways to think about it and a lot of people have written about it. Um, for myself, like when you're teaching, 
I just try to really emphasize to students who are completely unfamiliar with the content that this is not for them to own or take, right? And even this content they're viewing isn't even necessarily for them to understand. That the understanding they get from it is just quite small compared to the depth or the deepness of the mana in which they're um, getting to see. So like, for example, the film Kapai Mahu or even Kumuhina or Kekulana He Mahu or, um, you know, even things outside of this specific topic um, that they're only getting a partial understanding and they can see it and learn from it and use it as a way even to think differently about their own worlds and even the limits of, you know, the, the world that they live in, but it's not for them to own or possess or even as an identity to take on. I think that's similar to another question that was asked about non-Native students identifying with Two-Spirit or being inspired by it. I think there's space for that because heteropatriarchy constrains everybody in different ways. So you can be inspired by indigenous forms of gender and relationships as a way to think outside the constraints we all face today, but it's not something for you to take up as yours. So I try to get students to understand that and for them to understand their relationship to the material they're viewing or learning about. Thanks so much, Lonnie, and thank you so much for the question. You know, I was thinking, um, I was thinking about the the images that that I showed, the three images. Um, the first one, which is just a, a really important image for me, um, the image of um, oh, I was just going to show it, the image of the the young Marshallese, uh, uh, young young youth uh, in front of the the banner, right? The the banner is uh, um, uh, we are fight. At the end of the banner says that we are not drowning. We are fighting for our mokupuna. Right, or the next seven generations. I think about all the, the activist projects that we do here in the Bay Area um, that I'm a part of, and I really follow the lead of other uh, activists who came before me and in other organizations that we work specifically, we understand the importance of the narrative, and we want to be uh, the creator of those narratives. We want to know how these narratives are being um, navigated and consumed. I mean, you know, to the best that we can, of course, we can't control all of it, but a big part of what we do is we work with Indigenous um, photographers, right? Or also we have white allies uh, as well that we work with who have a long history. So we have a va, perhaps is what we could say. We, we that we va with these particular uh, individuals, photographers, artists, um, journalists, right? So they we know that they have a commitment to us and telling the story in a particular way. So that particular photograph was taken by a really good friend, uh, a white journalist, uh, uh, Dan Batcher. And it was important for Dan. After Dan took those photographs, he gave us all the imagery that he took. And he, Dan went specifically to take those photographs because we know that the mainstream media is not gonna tell the stories of us, right? I also, you know, I, I was thinking about another image, right? When I think about the querying the image, I was thinking about an image too that's really, really dear that I actually didn't include today. When I was thinking about uh, uh, a line of men uh, standing, Pacific Islander men using their big brown bodies. I think, uh, I think of, of the men, uh, of, of a beautiful photograph that we took of our brothers uh, in Solano prison a couple of years ago with my sister Lonnie Maitolu as uh, one of the, the leaders of that project. This is just right after the, the men had, uh, had offered, excuse me, the native Hawaiian chat, uh, Ikumamao. Right, Ikumama, what a beautiful chant. And this is right after they had taken it. And we took a photograph. Um, some of the other um, counselors who also came in took a photograph. And it's a photograph that I keep with me. But it's a photograph also that I chose deliberately not to show today because I wanted to, uh, I wanted to honor the men and their confidentiality. And also it was just a photograph. I was thinking about uh, the image, imagery of the men as well. Um, it was also a commitment to their stories because I'm also right, part of this book project is I'm also writing their stories. But this was also, I think about it in relation to this question, right? When we talk about queerness, part of working with the men in the prisons is you also, 
you know these stories that are not also told in the mainstream, including the mainstream in our Pacific communities, that the men's desires do not fall, like our brother Len said, do not fall into the cis uh, heteronormativity uh, lenses, right? But these are also stories that as a Pacific Islander practitioner, perhaps, so to speak, right? A Tongan practitioner, it's important for me. Those stories are, are so important. They, also, they not only fuel the work that I do because I also know these particular narratives that these men share with me, but for them, just like it is for me, right? Just like it is for me, like how I answered your question, Marlo. These men would identify as Samoan and a particular man would, a particular brother would say, Fui, to be Samoan is to also be queer, if I might also add into his, his quote, simultaneously, right? So I think also, Marlo, that's also how I'm answering your question when I say that I, de that I identify as Tongan and as a daughter of Mwananui, that heteropatriarchy is a Western construct. It is part of this white terror. So when I say that I don't use these particular terms as well within this carceral space, Right? California as a carceral space, as the First Nations people will tell us that this is a carceral space. So in this carceral space, who I am and how I identify and my self-determination, when we say that we're Tonga, like this man, this brother says he's, he's Samoan, it encompasses all of that, all the dreams and those possibilities. Great, thank you, thank you so much. Um, we have another question. Um, this one is from Malsina Falau, um, and it's for any, anybody. Uh, my question is directly to the racial bullying issue some Micronesians are facing in Hawaii. Uh, are these queer or identity-based? I am just curious on your take. I have some quick input on that. I like to compare um, <clears throat> what I've noticed just in my own um, personal studies is the plight of a new immigrant group coming into an area where there are existing groups. Uh, let's take the, um, uh, the people from El Salvador who came over in the 1980s as a result of the uh, conflicts that they were having down there. And a huge group of them moved into the MacArthur Park area of Los Angeles in the, the late 1980s, and there's already <clears throat> the, the Mexican and Black communities were already been strong there for 100 plus years. They experienced bullying, being the, um, for lack of a better term, new kids on the block, so to speak. And from that bullying and harassment, like the question is that's being posed, was burst the MS-13 gang. So thinking about how one immigrant group moves into an area and the things that they uh, experience. I currently work with, um, in the city of Oxnard, there are a group of people called Mistecos who are indigenous uh, uh, people from the, the uh, what's the name of that state? Oaxaca is the name of the province, but these are the indigenous within that province. So you already have the existing generations of Mexican people who've been working the fields in Oxnard, um, the Oxnard Plains areas, how it's identified. And now this new immigrant group on the block, and they are totally indigenous, they don't even have a written language. <clears throat> they're experiencing bullying. They're experiencing har uh, harassment. Now, I don't know what the remedy is. I'm just uh, sharing uh, just my personal experience and just seeing how when groups migrate, just the challenges that they face in these different ways. Um, so we are running low on time. Um, I didn't want to cut off anyone if anyone else had a response to that question. I can respond really quickly just because it's uh, recent. Uh, so what Len was talking about and to the question, there is immense racism that the Micronesian community faces in Hawaii. Um, just on the fact that they are the most recent migrants to Hawaii, 
and we know they had to migrate because their islands were decimated by nuclear fallout and everything else. And so they faced e intense racism in Hawaii. Most recently, just Monday, uh, Micronesian youth was gunned down by Honolulu police. Um, I remember Skycap, that's his name. He was 16 years old. Um, the media and the police are dealing with it very negatively. Go, you know, look it up. It is terrible. It is heartbreaking. And there's, um, you know, campaigns going right on right now to get justice for him and his family, as well as the other young boys, teenagers that were injured in this altercation with the police. So I just wanted to add that, that they face intense racism and we need to stand with that community right now. Great, thank you so much for that. Clearly there's so much to say. Um, we are running out of time. So we're gonna turn the time over to Miley who will um, lead us out. Thank you, everyone. Yeah, I just wanna echo my gratitude for all of the panelists. Um, it was such a powerful conversation and we, we so appreciate you all joining us. Um, and I also wanna thank everyone who uh, came in the audience as well as uh, just huge mahalo to our planning committee and event support, including Angela Robinson, who is, and Ane Tiolo, who have been managing things on the back end so well, um, as well as Tanji Bay, our moderator, but also Tanji did so much of the lead like work to set up this event, um, as well as Mikhail Kimbra and Hoku Aikau. We also want to thank Dean Catherine Stockton for her support, as well as our funders, again, the Mellon Foundation and the University of Utah's Global Learning Across the Disciplines grant from the Office of Global Engagement. So a recording of this panel and all of the others in our series will shortly be posted on our YouTube page. Um, I think the uh, link will be in the chat. And then uh, before everyone goes, there's just a few upcoming events and opportunities I want to make sure to share with you. Um, so first and foremost, um, we hope that you can join us for the rest of this symposium. Um, yeah, so the second panel for the day uh, starts at 3 p.m. Mountain Time, um, and it's titled We Sweat and Cry Salt Water, So We Know That the Ocean Is Really in Our Blood, Pacific Islander Diasporas in the Environment. Um, and the Zoom link for this next event is the same. So um, we are gonna go dark um, in between. So you will probably need to sign in again, but it's gonna be through the same Zoom link that you use to access this panel. Um, and that's the same for tomorrow, um, tomorrow's panels as well. The same Zoom link gets you access to every, all, the, all the panels. So yeah, and tomorrow, April 9th, we'll have two more panels focusing on issues of education and health. They'll also be at 1 p.m. and 3 p.m. Mountain Time. Um, you can also visit our website for more information on those. Um, and then a couple other opportunities and programs to let you know about. Uh, we have two other Pacific Island Studies programs under the leadership of Dr. Kehalani Vaughn um, and really supported with the work of Moana Ulu Ave Haofoka to make sure that you know about. The first is the Pacifica webinar series, which is wonderfully archived on our YouTube channel. Um, and the next event also, which will also be hosted on Zoom is Friday, April 23rd at 6 p.m. Mountain Time. Um, and that'll be a talk by Dr. Tina Delisle um, from the University of Minnesota. Um, and you can find more on her talk and on that series on our Facebook and Instagram pages as, as things get updated. The second program is the Pacifica Scholars Institute. And this program is for any of you who are or who know Pacific Islander uh, graduating seniors or transfer students interested in attending the University of Utah. This is a five day intensive program aimed at preparing students interested in Pacific Island studies and higher education culture and community-based leadership and learning. Um, this year, I believe it's entirely online um, and it'll be held June 7th to 11th and applications are due on May 28th. And then uh, finally, uh, for any Pacific Islander artists in Utah, please check out the Harvard Oceanic Collections Engagement Fellowship, which is this really cool opportunity that's offering funding for Pacific Islander artists who live in Utah to work with the Harvard Peabody Museum's Oceanic Collections. Um, and yeah, so I think that's all our announcements. Again, thank you so much for joining us and we hope to see you um, shortly again at the next panel at 3 p.m. So thank you.